The replication crisis is an ongoing methodological crisis primarily affecting parts of the social and life sciences in which scholars have found that the results of many scientific studies are difficult or impossible to replicate or reproduce on subsequent investigation, either by independent researchers or by the original researchers themselves. Because the reproducibility of experiments is an essential part of the scientific method, the inability to replicate the studies of others has potentially grave consequences for many fields of science in which significant theories are grounded on unreproducible experimental work. The replication crisis has been particularly widely discussed in the field of psychology and in particular, social psychology as well as in medicine and economics where a number of efforts have been made to reinvestigate classic results, and to attempt to determine both the reliability of the results, and, if found to be unreliable, the reasons for the failure of replication. In more robust fields, like astrophysics or mathematics, wholesale bullshit is somewhat harder to publish, and is way harder to get away with, in the long term. Richard Horton, editor of The Lancet, admitted that much of the scientific literature, perhaps half, may simply be untrue. In his words, science has taken a turn toward darkness. Non-replication of research discoveries is a consequence of the convenient, yet ill-founded strategy of claiming conclusive research findings solely on the basis of a single study assessed by formal statistical significance, typically for a p-value less than 0.05. UCL pharmacologist and statistician David Cahoon published a report in the Royal Society's Open Science in which he stated, if you use p equals 0.05 to suggest that you have made a discovery, you will be wrong at least 30% of the time. That's assuming the most optimistic view possible, in which every experiment is perfectly designed, with perfectly random allocation, zero bias, no multiple comparisons and publication of all negative findings. Colkhorn concludes, if, as is often the case, experiments are underpowered, you will be wrong most of the time. The numbers above are theoretical, but are increasingly being backed up by hard evidence. Peer reviews random and arbitrary nature was demonstrated as early as 1982. Twelve already published papers were assigned fictitious author and institution names before being resubmitted to the same journal 18 to 32 months later. The duplication was noticed in three instances, but the remaining nine papers underwent review by two referees each. Only one paper was deemed worthy of seeing the light of day the second time it was examined by the same journal that had already published it. Lack of originality wasn't among the concerns raised by the second wave of referees. The idea that research published in a scholarly journal is as likely to be wrong as it is to be right is difficult to absorb. But this is old news to venture capital investors. Bruce Booth of Atlas Ventures holds a PhD in molecular immunology from Oxford University. The unspoken rule, he wrote in early 2011, is that at least 50% of the studies published even in top-tier academic journals like Science, Nature, Cell, PNAS, etc., can't be repeated with the same conclusions by an industrial lab. That same year, employees of Germany's BioHealthcare reported that attempts to reproduce the findings of 67 studies involving promising drugs had resulted in a 75% failure rate. The investigators were surprised that research published in prestigious journals was no more reliable than research published in journals lower down the hierarchy. An equally alarming report appeared in Nature in 2012. Amgen, an American pharmaceutical company, had attempted to verify the findings of 53 landmark papers connected to cancer research. It was unable to do so in 47 cases or 89%. A 2008 survey found that referees typically spend a total of five hours reading a paper, preparing written feedback, and exchanging email with journal personnel. Some reviews are a single paragraph in length. There is no expectation on anyone's part that referees are conducting an audit. They typically don't examine raw data, computer codes, or even verify that cited sources say what the paper claims they do. If one receives what one pays for, it's worth noting that scholarly publishing's vaunted vetting process relies almost entirely on free, volunteer labor. The Royal Society, the world's oldest scientific academy, told the Commons Committee that peer review has stood the test of time and that all of its own publishing decisions have been made this way since 1660. But peer review didn't become widespread until centuries later. 
As Melinda Baldwin, the author of a book about nature, has observed, many of the most influential texts in the history of science were never put through the peer review process. Including Isaac Newton's 1687 Principia Mathematica, Albert Einstein's 1905 paper on relativity, and James Watson and Francis Crick's 1953 Nature paper on the structure of DNA. In fact, she says, Nature published some papers without peer review, up until 1973. Peer review remains highly non-standardized. Michael Callaham compares the current situation to a bygone era in which no license was required to practice medicine. Anyone can produce a journal and use any standards they see fit. After organizing for international peer review conferences between 1989 and 2001, Drummond Rennie concludes that the term peer review still seems to mean a great many things to different journal editors. An extensive body of research finds scant evidence that peer review accomplishes much at all, other than modestly improving the clarity of some manuscripts. On the other hand, a great deal of duly peer-reviewed scholarship has identified numerous deficiencies. In reality, peer review is an often perfunctory process that it takes place behind closed doors, with no enforcement of even minimum standards. The fact that a single scholarly journal, among an estimated 25,000, has performed a peer review ritual tells us little. The paper's data and computer codes have not been thoroughly examined, its arithmetic hasn't necessarily been checked. Its statistical analysis may or may not have received informed scrutiny. As the US National Science Foundation has recently reminded us, a scientific finding cannot be regarded as an empirical fact unless it has been independently verified. Peer review does not perform that function. Policymakers, journalists, and members of the public need to abandon the idea that peer-reviewed research is a sound foundation on which to base public policy. The reproducibility crisis currently gripping the scientific world indicates that, despite the widespread use of peer review, much of published academic research may simply be untrue. Replications, meta-analyses and systematic reviews are by their nature far more useful for portraying an accurate picture of reality than original exploratory research. But systematic reviews rarely make headlines. Which is a good reason the news is not the best place to get an informed opinion about matters of science. The problem is unlikely to go away anytime soon. So whenever you hear about a new piece of science news, remember the principles above and the simple rule of thumb that studies of studies are far more likely to present a true picture of reality than individual pieces of research.